Doki, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming out. Is this incredible weather for November or what? <laughs> so we're so lucky to have this nice warm evening for you guys to come out. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Starla Tronica. I get to work here at the fabulous Brooks Memorial Library. And I get to welcome you all to First Wednesday. And Maria's doing something to me now. Uh -huh. So first, of course, we want to thank our partners at Vermont Humanities, as well as the generous underwriters that make it possible to offer these really lovely programs. Um, our, the sponsor of our entire First Wednesday series is the Institute of Museum and Library Services um, through the De Vermont Department of Libraries. And of course, this Brattleboro series is funded by your friends and mine, the Friends of Brooks Memorial Library. So we're so grateful for them. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Love our friends. Um, so tonight we come together uh, to celebrate the wonderfulness that is in this neck of the woods and, uh, and to be inspired by our speaker and by one another. But before we begin, I do have a few things to say. Um, before you uh, leave, please check in for this event. And that is done by scanning this on your cell phone. And then tomorrow morning, Vermont Humanities will send you a very brief feedback form. Uh, and I want to let you know, that our next First Wednesdays event, Pandemic Architecture, Two Centuries of Disease and Design Talk with David Mills will take place on A Day to Live in Infamy, December 7th at 7 p.m. So um, please come back for that. And now it is my, oh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker, New Hampshire-based cartoonist, musician, and educator, Merrick Bennett lives leads discovery-based comics workshops for all ages, that's for all of us, uh, throughout New England and the world beyond. His comic work includes the graphic novel series, The Civil War Diary of Friedman Coleman, Colby, as well as drawing, translating, and editing for The Most Costly Journey, which is with the bilingual El Viaje Project, Mark is the recipient of the 2021 New Hampshire Governor's Art Award for Art Education. You can find him at his website, and you can find out more about Merrick in this wonderful book um, that is also the Vermont Humanities Reads title for this year, and we do have extra copies at the circulation desk that you can pick up and borrow and take home and read. So, Merrick, okay, let's see what we've got. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, wonderful. Wonderful to be here to celebrate the wonderfulness in this neck of the woods, as Star said. Um, I have a pop quiz to start off with. How many people know who uh, John Steele Tyler is? John Steele Tyler, does sound familiar at all? This is what I love about going places in person as a cartoonist. I bring my sketchbook, I scan the walls, I look around as people are filtering in. I found this painting back here in the corner. Deep Star is laughing. You know who John Steele Tyler is. I remember that. You remember that. So yeah. So John Steele Tyler, um, he was he was a major and then the colonel of the Second Vermont Regiment in the Civil War. I'm learning this just from the sign on the wall. I sound like an expert, maybe. Um, and he died at the Battle of the Wilderness at age 21, as colonel of a thousand Vermont men in the Battle of the Wilderness. And uh, boy, that when I found that sign, I said, I said, that guy, I've never seen that painting before, but that looks like a Civil War painting. And something in that sign drew me in. Um, I'm just finishing up a book that's coming out at the end of the month, so I'm you know, getting everything in order. Um, and it'll be out November 30th, no matter what. And it happens, a big part of it happens at the Battle of the Wilderness. Um, so now I'm thinking maybe I'll, I'll, we'll see how we do on the presentation. I might switch it up at some point and insert a couple pages that come directly from the second Vermont. Um, that it, it's wonderful to have James Steele Tyler looking over my shoulder here. Um, and th that's a good illustration of how I work as a cartoonist. I carry a sketchbook. I usually remember a pen. But if I don't, I could probably borrow one. Um, and then I like to go sit somewhere and see what I see and see whom I meet as I do that. 
Um, and then the stories come out of that, and that's basically my whole presentation tonight. But I'll show you some artwork for that. Um, yeah, I, I think what, it's wonderful to be here in the shadow of these immense displays, ah, in the silence of the lobby. Um, in the shadow of these immense displays of the most costly journey, this is a project that many of us, many, many people, uh, I don't know the exact number, it's over 40 people have been deeply involved in putting this book together and it's so gratifying to come to a Vermont library and see it going out as a Vermont Reads book um, and to see people going home with it and to see these stories becoming stories in our communities. Um, so I'll, sh I'll show some work from that, but I want to show it in the context of many years of drawing stories together and building communities through the stories we tell each other. Um, so. Without further ado, let's jump into some sketchbook pages. I thought we'd start uh, a little perversely with the most recent book um, that I brought to show people. This is my, from my Sharjah sketchbook. And just before the pandemic, um, I was lucky enough to take a trip to the United Arab Emirates to teach and draw and just soak up the um, atmosphere at the largest book festival in the Arab world. So this is um, Sharjah International Book Festival, uh, 2019. And I brought my sketchbook, and I just drew something every day. Um, and this is one, one of the things we did outside our classroom is uh, we would set up a table and do these table murals, the other artists and I. And we'd just set up big paper, and we'd start drawing. And within minutes, there would be just this crowd. I'd never experienced this kind of just hunger and interest and curiosity and creativity. Kids, strangers we'd never met, would bring their families out of the crowd and gather around the table, and we'd leave pens and markers laying around, and everybody was invited to take part in these murals. So every night we did this with the crowds, um, and this is one family at one end of the mural that they've just finished working on uh, with another artist, Deepak from Kerala, that I met there. Um, and just looking at these old photos, um, warmed my heart, but I want to show you some sketchbook pages because what I came to talk about tonight is how that act of drawing creates community, creates connections. Um, and the word draw has a lot of meanings. And I love how it means to draw something out, to draw something out, and to draw something in, and to draw something up, and to draw down, I guess, has maybe punishment connotations or something, but there's a lot of meanings for draw. Um, so this is what I look like when I'm in a place I've never visited before, maybe in a place I don't speak the language. I revert into a cartoon character, and I walk around with my sketchbook. Um, this is a photo I took before I realized you could go to jail for taking photos in public places uh, in the United Arab Emirates. So I, I went in and I took out all the faces, and I think it's legal. Um, please don't turn me in. Uh, 2019 Sharjah International Book Festival Fun Facts. 2,000 plus publishers and vendors from around the world, from 81 different countries, 1.6 million titles on display, 11 days and nights, October to November, 2.5 million visitors in this convention center, which is really a collection of convention centers. Uh, so I would just wander around and walk, and when I came to a place where I just felt a little overwhelmed and didn't know what I was doing here in between the classes I was teaching, I would sit down. And so these are pages from my sketchbook. All these are pages from my sketchbook. Expo Center Community. Walking the convention halls, so vast a river of readers. One way I get my ideas down is I draw little boxes, and then I put one thing in that box, and I put one thing in that box, and I read them together, and sometimes I have to move them around and shuffle them. Sometimes they make sense. Stopping to snap a photo at the Mexico Pavilion. I did have a camera on this trip. I usually don't travel with cameras, but I brought one just in case. And I put the photo in afterwards in my sketchbook. I left it blank for now. And then moving on. And then thinking of that word afterwards, snap, a quick moment. Also, the sound of something breaking, a disconnect, right? So coming back later to the same spot, but without my camera, 
with my sketchbook and just sitting to draw it. And that, that's, I, I copied the page of my sketchbook and stuck it into this page of my sketchbook. So now we're manipulating media. But that's how I drew the River of Readers and the Mexico Pavilion that I have a perfectly good photograph of. But what happens as I'm sitting there and drawing? Well, like I just hinted before, people come out of the crowd, right? And they, they want to see what you're doing. Let's see, next box. And I look up, and a father's brought his son by. Strangers stop to say hi. They peer over my shoulder, and then we're close. And so I'd look up and smile, and they'd smile back, and suddenly we'd have this connection. Um, they really seem to respond to somebody just sitting and doing something. Uh, we introduce ourselves. We notice each other. We start to converse back and forth, even putting the sketchbook down. Draw as in to pull together. And then just as I finished my page, I looked up and somebody had their camera on the snap. <laughs> they were taking a picture of me and I felt the tables turned. And this is the, um, the second page. I just sat on that little corner in the convention center that my first day in this place and drew. Um, and, it, and it really impressed me how just that act of saying, all right, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not a, a master painter or an expert architecture artist. I'm just going to doodle with my pen and see what comes out of this. And what really came out of it was I met some people that I then saw oh, several times over the course of the fair. And we passed, we crossed paths in the uh, convention centers and we'd stop and talk. And I had a community, a little superficial passing community at this. Um, at this book festival where before I didn't know anybody. Um, I want to show you a little bit of how this works too. So these are other sketchbook pages where each night after a, a day at the convention center, um, back at my hotel, I would just focus on getting down a couple conversations that I wanted to remember that were really important to me. So these, the, these couple pages here happen in the convention center at the presenters green room where people would gather in between classes and um, presentations and things. And one of the um, young women who was in there assisting and translating for everybody um, looked over my shoulder as I'm doodling in my sketchbook and said, so why do you draw yourself as a rabbit? So this is maybe a good point to talk about cartooning. I put it up here. Um, as a cartoonist, my goal in drawing something is not to draw every detail I see. I'm not a portrait artist or even a caricaturist, I think. As a cartoonist, my goal is to draw, this sounds like I'm being lazy, to draw as little as possible. Because when I draw as little as possible, I have to get to the heart of the story, the heart of the picture. Um, so often I draw stick figures. Sometimes if I want to be more specific, I might look around the room and decide if you all have beards and glasses and hats on, I won't use those details to distinguish myself, but if I'm the only person with that combination, that might be enough to make this slightly crazy looking stick figure into the merit figure for this group, <laughs> right? And as a cartoonist, I'm always thinking, you know, can I stop there? Is it complete enough that you would see a person with what I'm wearing basically? and not confuse it with something else, just getting to the heart of the story, or the, the heart or the bare bones, whichever metaphor you like to use. Um, and often when I'm doing my travel journals as a cartoonist, I will draw myself as this cartoon bunny rabbit just because I find it disarming to myself. I don't have to worry about, is my hair combed? What am I wearing? I'm just a bunny rabbit, and I go with that, and I feel more friendly when I'm transformed into the bunny rabbit. So she. She says, so why do you draw yourself as a rabbit? Well, I think it shows you more about me, you know? What do you mean by that? People are really into conversations in this green room. People would have these intense conversations, strangers you'd never met. I mean, it shows you my heart. She looks skeptical. Uh, like, for example, which animal would you be? Now, clearly, I'd already chosen. I would draw her as maybe a little not sure what animal she is, maybe a bear or a, little, or a gopher or something like that. Unspecific. She says, ah, 
I think this will be difficult because I will be a mythical beast. What is it? The horse with the horn. And her cousins are with her. Um, this is Zahira and the Zahra. And uh, I think we'll learn all the names as we go. Yes, that is it. I will be the unicorn. And her cousins are laughing. Ha ha, hee hee. And I'm thinking, well, that's a first. Because I ask that question a lot if I'm drawing a school group or somebody I'm working with. I say, what animal do you want to be? Here in New England, us sensible Yankees, we always want to be like a cat or a dog or something useful, right? Um, and I'd never been in a culture, a, a lot of kids, when I asked them, wanted to be a mermaid, a dragon, fantastical beasts. Um, and of course, I learned as we went that has a lot to do with the history of images in this part of the world and how they were used. But um, she actually said, but you should not draw that. And part of my project as a cartoonist traveling to this new part of the world was, what is it okay to draw? And what is maybe a little transgressive to draw? You should not draw a unicorn, though. Better, I will be the dolphin. Oh, I hadn't planned that when I started drawing the conversation. Now suddenly she's a dolphin. This will be much easier for you to draw, yes? Um, well, we just had a whole conversation about the veil and what hair can be visible through the veil. Can ears be visible? No, 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 ears cannot be visible. Now I'm trying to think, how do I ask my new friends, is a dorsal fin okay to show through the veil or should it be covered? Like, what are the rules around this? But they're all having fun. So what does this tell you about me, huh? She very quickly figured out, oh, he's using this to get at character and heart. So about who I am, the dolphin, what does this tell you? Well, let's see. What does it tell us about her? Uh, dolphin is uh, intelligent, helpful, always swimming alongside. Uh, she's there working as a translator, right? Perfect animal for a translator. Very playful, too. Mm. Always talking, sharing, always friendly. Ha, yes, not bad. And her cousin that I just met that day says, what about me? I am cat. Oh, Zahra. I was trying to figure out how to draw Zahra and what animal she was. Okay, um, cat is uh, intelligent, always watching, yes. Oh, a very good hunter. Mm -hmm. Playful, but also can be a bit dangerous. Ha ha, a cat. And Zahira says, cat is too independent. That's why I'd never have a cat. Ha 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 ha, and we're all laughing together. And by building these characters together, and they're actually looking over my shoulder as I'm doodling in my sketchbook, we're really getting to know each other on this level where if I say, oh, what do you do for a job? You know, you'll tell me you're a dentist or a librarian. That tells me something about you. But the fact that you're a unicorn, no way to dolphin, tells me so much more. Um, the dolphin in the desert. So I'm thinking, well, oh, this is wrapping up nicely. <laughs> wow, that's pretty cool. Zahra says, and now, what about you? Huh, me? Whoa, wait, I, rabbit, and they just launch right into it. Rabbit is quiet, cautious, likes to sit in corner and watch. Hmm, yes, and draw in his book. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I've been doing. Huh? Very observant, quick to learn, yes, but not always trusting. Maybe quick to run away. I've never had strangers read me quite like that. My friends, thank you. <laughs> we will come back to see what you draw up up there. Actual conversation, right? I mean, it probably took place over 15 minutes. It probably had 10 times as many words in the conversation. But my job as a, a sketchbook artist and a cartoonist is to really take my memory of that story and say, OK, if I'm going to tell this in four or five pages, what are, how can I tell it drawing as little as possible? Um, you might have noticed every now and then I'll give a hint of the bookshelves that you don't really see much, but I just kind of remind the reader there's a table and chairs there. But most of the time, I try not to draw things. I try not to put details in, because by leaving them out, it leaves space for things. Um, 
And that to me is what cartooning is all about. And what you're also seeing here, the language I'm using here by putting little boxes on the page and doing one idea in each box, is I'm creating comics. And comics are nothing more than multiple images in sequence. They can have text worked into the image. Text is part of the image, it's part of your visual field. Uh, but they don't have to be read in any one particular order. But it is important to know that whether your readers read, for instance, left to right, or as in an Arabic culture, right to left, because this tells two very different stories, depending on which direction you read it in, right? First story, what's the first story that this tells? Just shout it out, what do you think? Left to right, let's say. I think that that's the first story. What do you see? I test my work out on readers. Is it too hard to see? Did I do it too small? No, he's very pleased. He has an ice cream cone. But it looks like he may have dropped it or something. There we go. Yeah. That's what I was hoping you would see, right? Yeah. It was a leading question. But I like to point out, I didn't draw dropping the ice cream cone. I drew before and after, and you imagine dropping the ice cream cone if we communicate, if we commune over this idea. Um, if you read it right to left, of course, you see, oh, they found some ice cream on the ground and they walked off with it or something like that, which is a very different story. Um, but I love that about comics. It's, it's partly intuiting uh, and understanding what your readers are going to see, and partly just, get, for me, getting something down and then stepping back and looking at it with other people and making connections that way. Um, zip ahead several days, last couple pages of this sketchbook. Drawing among the crowds on that last night. Oh, I'd never been in a crowd quite like that that just went for seven, eight convention center halls after another, just packed with people, all with like shopping carts full of books, like a year's supply of books at this book festival. Um, all in languages I couldn't read and had never even seen before, you know, most of them. And I'm drawing in the crowd and these sisters draw near and watch closely. These three sisters down in the corner here as I'm drawing. And one of them leans over and says, in, in testing out her English on me, so you draw everyone? Mm -hmm. Can I draw you? Well, yeah, who's gonna draw it right? Who draws me? And this is the, the Merrick as Rabbit picture she drew. This is Shaza. Sharjah is a beautiful place, she wrote in as my thought bubble, testing out her English. And I just watched her, and then afterwards I cartooned her from memory. I didn't ask her if she wanted to be a bunny. I thought, I think we're both bunnies. Um, so that's, that's an example of sketchbook pages. I always bring a sketchbook wherever I go. I always work in that very undemanding um, mode, because the wonderful thing about a sketchbook is I didn't come in here with a plan to draw John Steele Tyler, uh, you know, from a painting, but the world, the community puts that up on the wall, and if I pay attention and notice it, it gives me something to draw, and it gives me a story that then I can connect with people about. Um, this project, the, the biggest project I've worked on in the past decade uh, is this series of graphic novels, The Civil War Diary of Freeman Colby. And it came about in, in pretty much the same way. I, I, um, it, it's a longer story, but I was done with my previous graphic novel and I wanted to learn local history. And so I started poking around at the local historical society and in just one box I found this diary by a school teacher. Um, I'll introduce you to Freeman Colby. The trick with Freeman Colby is I have never found a photograph of him. And honestly, I haven't looked very hard. I don't think any photograph exists anymore. Uh, because I think the historical society would have it. So in my draw as little as possible mode, I draw him basically as a stick figure with a couple hairs on his forehead. And this is the only time I've drawn him with a nose, actually, the cover of the first book. Um, this is what his diary looks like, archived in the Henniker New Hampshire Historical Society. I think it was typed up by his niece, maybe 100 years ago, maybe 60 or 70 years ago, I'm not sure. Um, and it's 30-some pages of typewritten text, no pictures, and it may have just sat on the shelf for 40 or 50 years, um, gathering dust, because I never found anybody in town who had read it, the diary of Freeman E. Colby. So, 
I go home, I get out my sketchbook. Uh, this was in uh, 2012, I was making a lot of sketchbooks just by stapling paper together. Got out my little sketchbook and drew some boxes and started drawing. The challenge I gave myself was, can I use only the words of this diary to tell the story here? I'll put a little bit of these words in each box, in each panel, and then I'll draw a little picture to go with it. And would that make sense to tell a story? So you're actually reading. I mean, we could sit here and just read from this for the next few hours, you know, and we would have read the whole diary. Or you can take home, you know, from your favorite local library, you can take home the graphic novel, and you can sit and read that for a few hours, and you'll get uh, the diary plus whatever research and, and drawing I put into it. So here's what it, so this is the introduction. This is how Freeman Colby introduces himself, the first paragraph of his diary. This is where I fell in love with the story and got interested in it. Civil War Diary of Freeman E. Colby. This starts in April 1861, Hanneker, New Hampshire. When the war broke out, I was at home helping my father with the work of the farm. I was then just turned 21. Most of my time after finishing school, which was what high school was called at the time, had been spent there on the farm or at school teaching. Oh, he's a teacher. I'm a teacher too. I connect with him that way. What was it like to teach school? Oh, he's gonna tell us. At keeping school, I had had good success. And in schools where there were many scholars, older and larger than myself, these are kids in their 20s plus kids, scholars, 25 year olds say scholars, bigger than he is. I had never failed to keep order. Several times I had finished the terms of teachers who had left their schoolrooms <laughs> by the windows. I think he has a sense of humor here. He's letting us, this is like not showing the ice cream dropping. He's going to let us imagine what that means in these little one-room schoolhouses. At this, Henniker's a small town. At this time, there were 13 one-room schoolhouses around town because you're not going to travel five miles to go to school, right? You're going to go to the schoolhouse that's a mile or two at the most from your home. Uh, Henniker's about six miles on a side, square town. Um, so that's, you're going to travel half a mile or less to a schoolhouse. And he's a substitute going around to, well, the most interesting schoolhouses, let's say. And as I tried to be just, as well as strict, my services were in demand. There is a note in the um, town report of 1861 from the school committee encouraging teachers to use the stick a lot more on the students. It's sort of a kids these days note. So. <laughs> Um, so that's what influenced me to draw that panel that way. Again, Freeman Colby's words, I went through in a copy and, and broke it up into individual thoughts and then said, oh, that's, that's eight thoughts in that sentence there, so let's draw eight boxes and see what goes in each box. Um, and it's a discovery process for me. I didn't set out with this vision in mind on the page. I set out with eight empty boxes and then I said, Teachers who had left their schoolrooms by the windows, what could that look like? Um, and you could take it any kind of direction. You could draw what's inside the room. You could draw what led to that. Uh, you could draw the teacher getting fired or something. Colby entering through the door there. Now, particularly in districts where each winter term was expected to commence with a set to between the master or teacher and a half dozen more of husky lads whose muscles were toughened by the use of sigh and flail and ax. These are lads who are larger and older, older and larger than he is, and whose ideas of independence would not permit them to learn of one who could be either frightened or licked. They're the master and not the scholars had to stand being hazed. But I was anxious to get some opening that promised better returns. So guess what he does in 1862? When he leaves, he quits his teaching job because it's too violent. Guess what he does? Joins the army. Yeah, he tries a number of other jobs and ends up in the army, right? Um, yeah, so that, that, just that sense of humor and that 
surprising view of my own hometown that I thought I knew, but really I had no idea of what it was like in 1861 to teach in a one-room schoolhouse. Um, and still I have more questions than I have answers. But by reading those words closely and breaking them down into what I think of as the individual ideas, and then giving each idea a little panel um, to, to show something visually in, uh, I found I've come to a sense of rhythm, a sense of uh, what I think is the spirit, the heart of the story. Um, and that basically looks like this. I mean, that one page, that one sentence becomes, uh, two sentences becomes one page. And I quickly realized, you know, a single page of typewritten transcript quickly becomes 10 to 12 pages drawn out. And I did the math, and it came out pretty much right. In about four years, I had a 350-page graphic novel <laughs> done. Um, I didn't work every day on this, because I'm, I'm also teaching. I go around and teach comics in schools. I was also um, finishing up the book I had been doing before of family stories from Eastern Europe. And so I do a bunch of projects at once, um, and sketchbooks also. Um, and when I get stuck on one thing and want to procrastinate a little, I just jump to another project. So I can always be procrastinating on something, which feels great, but always getting something done. Um, so that became part of the work I was doing. And while I was doing that, before I had finished the book, 2015 or so, was when I met um, Andy Clovis, and he introduced me to Julia grand -Dusset. I think I was teaching some classes at Center for Cartoon Studies up in, um, not Fellows Falls, White River Junction, and Andy came to talk about drawing comics from other people's stories, comics ethnography. Right, where you draw somebody's story, and I, I don't say, oh, what's your story? Great, I'll draw it up. Great, I made a comic, everybody. The project is more collaborative, where you tell me a story, I say, did it look like this? And you get to say, yeah, that's what I want my story to look like, or no, that's not what I want my story to look like. Let me explain that differently, uh, which I can't really do with Freeman Colby. I can a little bit, uh, and I'll show you how I've started working with, la the, with later volumes. I do a lot more fact checking and I corroborate his story because one thing I realized when I got to the end of drawing his diary is how many people here keep a diary? Anybody? It's kind of out of fashion these days. Yeah, a couple of us keep journals or diaries. Um, there's a couple ways to ask this question. I guess, do you always tell the truth in the diary? <laughs> you, you may try to, but you always get every fact right. Do you have omniscient understandings of what's going on in the stuff you're dealing with in your diary? Not at all. And whether you know it or not, you're telling part of the story from a certain angle, and you're also leaving a whole lot out. You know, I started by mentioning James Steele Tyler. I didn't mention the prodigal son on this side, right? Which is another story and another fascinating painting in artist history um, that I only know from reading the, the little tag under the painting. but. Um, we have to tune stuff out and focus in if we're gonna draw as little as possible, if we're gonna to get to the heart of the story. And those choices uh, are, are the same choices we make when we say, oh, what is our community here? Who's allowed in this space? Who's allowed to contribute stories to the historical society? And who's not part of our community? And who's not allowed in this space? Huh? Either by signs saying not allowed or by understood. Uh, limitations. So while I'm working on this, and maybe I'll, I'll skip ahead a little, I, I can, if people are interested, I can come back and talk about working from primary sources, uh, and especially when we have text and visuals, and we can put them together to come to a different understanding of the story, and working from multiple narrators, multiple storytellers. Uh, this is all stuff that I picked up from working on the most costly journey with Andy and Julia and Teresa and all the storytellers and artists in that project. Um, and I've since fed into the Freeman Colby project. I realized part of what I'm doing um, when, as a sketchbook artist and a cartoonist, my goal is to, like I say, draw as little as possible, but simplify the production process, simplify the creative process. So in a standard uh, mainstream comics creative assembly line, you might have uh, a step of creating your comic where you do some research. You also might have a step where you script the comic out. People like to write or type up 
page one, panel one, we see an explosion. Colby starts talking about the war. Panel two, and you'll have a script. That's especially important if you have multiple artists working together. Um, then usually someone will thumbnail, that is draw each page about the size of a thumbnail so you can't put a lot of detail in it, but you can say, oh, this page is gonna have a big picture, this page will have lots of panels, this page will have talking, this page will have an explosion, that sort of thing. Then you might have an artist do the pencils, which is just what it sounds like. You take the paper, you draw on pencils, or nowadays you do it digitally more often than not. I always do analog on paper. Uh, and you'll, you'll pencil out those pages. Then they'll pass it off to someone who does the inks, and they lay the ink over those pencils. And often there's somebody who does lettering, and I even forgot to include coloring, if you're doing coloring, too. And then there's always some editor looking over all those shoulders, marking it up and making changes. And then maybe in several years you get to publication, right? And I realized, boy, if I'm doing this indie style on my own, um, then I really have, I do the research by finding a diary and making sure it's an actual diary, checking it with the historical society, checking with the family, making sure you know this is a real thing and not a faux document. Um, and really the document is the script. Right? Freeman Colby wrote the script for me over 100 years ago of his diary and then the family put it in the historical society to say, hey, let's make this a story of our community. I don't know if they knew it was gonna sit on a shelf and nobody in the community would know it or not, but at least it's in the archive. And then the thumbnails, I mean, I'm drawing stick figures. That's kind of like thumbnails. But all that pencils, inks, lettering, editing. What if, like, we could get rid of the pencils and the inks and the fancy lettering and just do it all in the thumbnail phase? And since, I mean, honestly, since I don't have a photo of Freeman Colby, I don't know what he looks like, so maybe that stick figure is as close as I'm gonna get. And I don't know what the school building he, he was in looked like because there's no photo of inside that one-room schoolhouse. So maybe that stick figure school building that I drew there, which is really just a door and an occasional table, maybe that's as good as I'm gonna get. Maybe the most honest thing is to stop at the thumbnail, skip all those other steps, and maybe I can also come up with a way to do my editing and then share it with readers and they can give me feedback. So before final publication in book form, I have to publish it eight or 16 pages at a time as mini comics. And that's, um, that takes this sort of a format. Where did that go? So one of the formats I like to use is I'll get six or seven or eight pages together. This is from volume three. I'll put them all together like this and I'll set it up so when I fold this page, whoops, when I fold it flat on a table, it becomes a little eight page book and you can read through and read a few pages and hopefully get interested enough to say, I'm gonna check out this guy's website and see that what the next mini comic is. And also maybe tell me, hey Merrick, I think you misspelled forward here, I think it's, it's an F, not a PH, or something like that, you know. Um, so the editing process is actually wrapped, iterated into the publication process. Every school I go to, I can take this down to the copy machine and make 20 copies and hand them out to the students and say, hey, you wanna help me make this graphic novel? Please give this a read and let me know what you like, what catches your eye, and anything that confuses you. Uh, so then when it comes time to finish the book, I've actually done a lot of my editing and I've started to build the readership by sharing it around and I've had a lot of kids look at this and say, stick figures, huh? I could draw that. And it's like, yeah, you could. <laughs> and here's how to make the book and here's how to draw the pages. Uh, now go to town on it. Um, so hopefully it inspires other artists too. Basically what I'm doing is cutting out all those steps, doing some research, finding a script, drawing my thumbnails and then saying, good enough, stick figures, good enough. Moving on, not getting into all the fancy artistic stuff, drawing as little as possible to get the story out to the public, the people who are gonna read it and enjoy it and share it. Um, so again, that, that of course leads to a lot of trial and error where I can pull the story of January 1st, 1864, try it out on a page, maybe add a map in so you see what they're talking about as they describe this 
then I might scrap that entirely and say, you know what? This single panel needs to be a two-page spread. Let's draw it out, boom, as a two-page spread. And that's how this is going to appear in volume three. You'll open it up, and this is the first two pages of the story. So January 1st, dawns bright and cold, the weather having cleared in the night. And here's one of our characters, Jonas Bacon, on picket duty. Now, of course, I don't, the thing is, I don't, I like to use my imagination, but I wasn't there in Virginia in 1864, but you know what? Edwin Forbes was there on that very river, January 20th. So we're, this is a few weeks later, but he's drawing the winter weather, looking towards the mountains, over the river. He's giving me all this information about what these guys are looking at that they did not write into their diaries because they had to get to the heart of the story and cut out a lot, right? So thank goodness for the artists who were on, the site, on site there uh, because I know what it looked like to be on picket duty. So I know what their shelters were like, the activities they do and how they, how they I know how they thought of it because of the accounts that the soldiers wrote down. Um, so that brings us, of course, then those soldiers come back to Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, and some of those letters and diaries get into historical societies, get into uh, state historical societies, libraries, and all the different archives. Um, and Library of Congress is a big help in the art side of this research. But that brings us back to New England and how we tell our stories about our communities and who gets to tell their stories. Uh, so there is a long story to the most costly journey. Um, but I don't think I'll get into the, the full project background tonight, but I want to share with you a couple of um, pages of what this looks like, what the creative process of this looks like. Because what I found with Freeman Colby's diary, I couldn't ask him what he meant here or there. I couldn't ask him if this was uh, appropriate for his story. I had to just go to other people's accounts and bounce ideas off of them and see if they all agreed and pick the things that they agreed with. The cool thing about the most costly journey and working on this at the same time is if I had a question, I could send it back to the storyteller. So I don't know how many people here have read the most costly journey so far. Librarians, all right, we gotta get this out to people then. So um, all Vermont libraries can get it through Vermont Reads from Vermont Humanities. Uh, and you can get sets of them and do a reading group and everybody gets a copy. So it's a wonderful way to get these stories out. The basic idea is the subtitle, Stories of Migrant Farm Workers in Vermont drawn by New England cartoonists. So Julia Grand Doucette was the precipitating factor. She had this idea. Um, so she was getting all these patients coming into the, um, the free clinic in Middlebury who were presenting symptoms that she couldn't quite diagnose what a medical cause would be. But she realized it was from stress and trauma, from the experience of being uh, undocumented farm workers in and not speaking the language and not knowing what was safe to do and what would get them deported. Um, and well, I'll let them tell their own stories. Her idea though, was that if she could, that creating narrative is an important part of healing and you can't heal without creating a narrative that gets you to healing. And part of creating narrative is sharing it with your community. Uh, so she, she decided, you know what, I'm gonna ask these people, uh, what's your story? Where, are you, where, where do you come from? What does this make you think of? Um, and she did little interviews with them around certain topics that the clinic and the patients felt were really important to mental health and to physical health in their community. Um, so I'll let them speak for themselves if we have a couple examples here. Oh, well, so the first one that I got involved with, they sent me this transcript uh, from a storyteller who chose the name Jose. All storytellers use pseudonyms here. This was collected in 2014, and I think it came to my desk in 2015, uh, a few months later. And it, it was a longer transcript. This is just a piece of it, but this is how the transcript started. It's painful to remember. It all started May 21st, 2008. It was the day I entered the United States. I've been here for six years now. Before Vermont, I was living in Amsterdam, New York State, and Jose is telling a story here, right? And what I just, I, I wanted to do was at once um, help the reader into the story, 
and also completely honor the choices, the narrative choices the storyteller was making. The first thing I noticed here with my editorial hat on was, okay, we can, we can take Jose's story on the left here and we can put a map to it. The first thing I noticed is it's out of the geographical or chronological order I expected, right? He says, uh, it all started May 21st. It was the day I entered the United States, so we're right on that border where Jose entered the United States. I've been here for six years now. Before Vermont, I was living in Amsterdam. So Vermont, I, before that, I was in Amsterdam. My home is in Guatemala, in Quilco, in Huehuetenango, down in Guatemala there. From Guatemala to the Mexican-American border, the journey lasted six days. And my first reaction was, oh, well, Jose, we gotta put that in order. People want things in chronological order. So when were you born, and when did you start off from, and then where did you go, and then where did you go? Thinking step by step as a cartoonist. But then I, I stepped back before I asked that, and I thought, what if, but this is Jose's story, so what if this is an opportunity to get into the order Jose is telling us the story in, and we have to present it differently visually. First thing I thought of, too, was a narrative that comes from the south of the map to the north presents a problem for readers because we're used to reading top-down, on printed pages at least. Not so in stained glass windows you read from the bottom up, or in Instagram accounts they read from the bottom up, right? And we're all used to those sorts of reading orders. But when you pick up a printed page, you expect to start from the top and read down. So, I don't know, what if we flip the map over? <laughs> and then, then you could start in Guatemala and you could end up in Vermont the way my chronological order wanted. Now, wait a minute, that's gonna confuse the reader more, isn't it, right? To flip a map over, suddenly it looks very alien. Maybe that's appropriate, but that's not the sense I'm getting from Jose. What we finally decided was that Maybe flipping the map just enough so that it's recognizable, but the action moves from left to right and down to the bottom is enough to help the reader kind of feel they're flowing through the page and ending where they want to end so that then you turn the page to move on to the next. And that became the first page of the story. So, as Jose tells, now, now we can use pointers to help the reader understand where we are geographically as we respect the storyteller's chronology. It is painful to remember. It all started on May 21st, 2008, the day I entered the United States. I've been here for six years now, living in Vermont, and before that, in Amsterdam, New York. My home is in Guatemala, in Quilco, Huehuetenango. From Guatemala to the Mexican-U.S. border, the journey lasted six days. We spent one day and one night in the border area. We were a group of 15 people, and I didn't know anyone. So I'm, I'm drawing my stick figures, right? I'm coming from, I, I'm just drawing pages in Freeman Colby. I'm thinking, this is the best way to show the story. Um, and when I passed these pages through Julia back to Jose, Jose's reaction was, well, okay, it's my story, but I, I don't want to be a stick figure. And that was the only instruction I got back. I wasn't in direct contact with Jose. There's a couple, a bunch of ways we did the collaborations. Uh, and for this one, it passed through a nurse who was doing home visits who knew Jose, and that was a better conversation um, than if some stranger came in. And said, hey, I'm drawing your story. What do you think of this page? You're likely not, you might not get the best feedback that way. Um, so I went in and I gamely gave it a try. I converted stick figures to slightly cartoony characters, gave Jose a baseball hat, um, and explained, you know, well, I, I don't want to do too many details, but I want to represent you at least so that you feel comfortable with that. And I retold the story and changed some of the artwork. So going back to our first draft, you can see how the stick figures kept sort of flat and iconic. And then adding, changing that face from a stick figure with no face to an actual face starts bringing in slightly more realistic settings. I just found it started to change the art form, the artwork. This was another page from my first draft where uh, it, this is a story of the dangers of crossing the border in the desert, how Jose came to be working on Vermont farms in northern Vermont. Um, and the trauma that that trip left Jose with. So one of the things that happens is 
a woman's bitten by a rattlesnake and their guides tell them, we have to leave her here. And he doesn't know what happens to her. Um, so I drew it out in stick figure form in panels thinking, okay, chronologically, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. And Jose's response was, oh, it wasn't like that at all. No, it was, this, this makes it look very step by step. It was, uh, it was confusing. It, everything happened at once. I didn't even know what was happening. Uh, it just all happened at once. Okay, well, let's try to do that. So we got rid of all the panels and we stepped back and led into that scene a little more. And maybe we bring the reader in. So instead of seeing stick figures from across the room, like in this page, and you're looking at stick figures from a ways away, maybe we bring you in so you're in close to our feet and our backpacks and we get to learn a little more about each other. So we walk through the desert, another 12 hours or so, Jose tells us. Each of us carries four gallons of water, two bags of bread, four cans of tuna, two packs of cookies. And there's another guy with him. Hey, good to meet somebody else from Guatemala. Yeah, it helps just to talk about home. And then around 1 or 2 a.m., screaming. I, I don't know what this is. I turn the page. And what the? Helper, rattlesnake. Where? Look out. Oh, my God. Oh, no, oh, no. She just sat down for a second. She's a goner. Quick, do something. All the voices kind of piled in at once. And the guide says, we go. She stays. What? How can you now go? And he has to leave. Maybe this is a good stopping point for tonight. Um, the thing with Jose, Jose taught me here that when I want a story to happen all at once and to feel confusing and fast, sometimes I have to slow down and take six pages instead of a single page. Right? So it takes a lot more paper. Uh, well, six pages, more page turns, larger panels, and the effect is that it feels more confusing and faster for some reason. Not something I would have known before we went through this process. Sadly, by the time I got it to this point uh, and sent the pages back to Jose to get thumbs up or thumbs down, Jose had disappeared. Uh, Jose, hopefully at the end of his story, he says, you know, I haven't seen my kid. She's six years old now. And she was born, you know, just when I left. And I want to go back and see her soon. And that's the final panels of his story. And all we could do, all I could do was on the last panel, it says, you know, before, before we could finish production of this comic, Jose disappeared and nobody knows where he went to. So I hope Jose made it back to see his daughter. Uh, but the nature of these stories is that, um, I mean, read the book, you'll, you'll get a sense. People are very articulate in explaining that this is all about family and they're here for their families, counterintuitively. Um, and and they're, they're really clear about what they're doing. Um, and really, the, the important thing here, I think, is that they could tell their stories, and then it became a comic under their approval, under their final say. And then those comics went out as mini comics that were passed around among other farm workers. So other farm workers who were dealing with the same issues or had similar stories could read the comic, see something of themselves and something, and connect with it in some way. And then at the back, there's a list of resources. Uh, and for several years, all the El Viaje project was just mini comics passed around among farm workers, given out by nurses on home visits, um, dealing with all sorts of health topics. And then we've been very lucky with, with a lot of support, with Kickstarter support, with Vermont Humanities and the Vermont Reads program. We've been able to put it together as a graphic novel and get it out to communities. And uh, I guess the, the, the closing, I'll, I'll end there um, unless anybody has questions or you want to, or have missed something and you want to talk about something else. But I just want to point out, you know, now we can read these stories and these are our communities. And I'm just so honored to be a part of that process of realizing these stories, making the invisible visible uh, with the work of the storytellers and all the artists and all the editors and translators and clinic, clinic um, visiting nurses and, and all the people involved in the project, we can make those stories visible and they become, they're in the library now and they're part of our communities now. So every time you pour some milk in your coffee, 
that milk has a story to it, and you can know a little bit of that story by reading the graphic novel where they get to tell, these workers get to tell their story. Um, so that's, that's something that I'm very honored by to be a part of, and I carry back into all my work um, with Civil War narratives, with libraries that I visit, uh, with every school I visit. So thank you for being a part of that tonight. Thanks for introducing me to James Steele Tyler. I'll see if I can work him into volume four. Um, and any questions? Thanks to the thank Vermont Humanities too, I should say. Thank you so much, Merrick. This was lovely. Um, I'll never look at graphic novels the same. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> uh, do, does anyone have any questions? I just had a thought. To me, comics, the word comics and cartooning are like two separate things. With comics, I think of Archie and Jughead and there's a funny humorous part or you do get the superhero like Superman comes in and mm -hmm. saves people in the city. And yet, this is, in my mind, this is more cartooning because Jose doesn't really have a happy ending. You know? Right. And, you know, I can almost feel it sitting here. So I just see it as a very different wording in my mind. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, the word comics in English has a history to it, and the way the art form has been used uh, is, is what causes that to be our word for it, right? right. Um, all around the world, it, the, the idea to say, I do sequential visual narratives just doesn't draw the kids into the, you know, hey kids, sequential visual narratives. Um, but that's really what you're talking about. In English, we happen to say comics because of the history of how they were used in the newspaper industry with funny punchline comics. Um, and then comic books, I mean, Action Comics, issue one with Superman, there's very little funny about that book. Uh, it's the story of an immigrant who is hiding his identity, who comes to this planet or country, changes his name to fit in, and occasionally rips off his clothes to have a funny folk costume underneath that enables him to um, fight, fight power and protect the oppressed. That's what it says in the early Superman comics, right? Um, drawn by two Jewish kids from Ohio, on the eve of the Holocaust, right? And they were aware of what was going on in the world as they crafted that story, um, more or less, you know? Um, so in a way, there's just nothing comical about that story, you know? <laughs> and yet, because of the history, the publishing is history and how the genres were defined, we have the word comics that we use in English. Um, there wasn't that word, say back in the Civil War, but you still see artists using panels and telling pictures. Uh, Winslow Homer did a series of comics, basically, that were like little cards you could put in order to tell a story. Uh, but they just didn't call them comics. That wouldn't have been a word they used, I don't think. And cartoon, the word cartoon comes from the Renaissance. It's the carton, it's the scrap paper that uh, painters would use to just scribble stick figures and work out where's God and where's Adam, and okay, let's go paint that ceiling. Right? Um, but those were cartoons. Look up uh, Da Vinci cartoons or Michelangelo cartoons and you'll see some cartoons by them. They don't look like Mickey Mouse, but um, they are quick drawings. So they're, these, these words have stories too, and the way we use the words kind of accumulates meaning in stories, and then they, it also hones our expectations too. Uh, I'm much more comfortable saying this is a graphic novel, but it's also a comic book, but it's not comical. And we're using cartooning, but there's very little cartoony about it. Yeah, it's very serious work. And the words, I think it's kind of funny that <laughs> we use these words for it. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, I uh, first and foremost just want to thank you. Um, I shared this book with a few students um, at the elementary school I work at, and I just found it to be very helpful when they're able to see this type these types of situation, these types of farms, and these types of workers on their school bus ride home and whatnot. Um, so just to my question, I was thinking, how difficult is it for you to, to keep the details at a minimum 
that you were talking about to, to let the story and the heart of the story really project through um, without those, those details. Yeah, it's, it's a real balance to strike because uh, at once, at, on the one hand, the fewer details there are, this is just the way I think of it, every artist will answer this differently. So I'm not speaking for the project, I'm speaking for Merrick Bennett, stick figure, sketchbook artist, I guess. I find the fewer details I put in, the more kind of universal it is to a point. Um, and I was making that point in a panel we did up in uh, Resilient Vermont, up at Norwich University uh, in May. And one of the young women from Norwich who, who uh, works with the Afghani community in Northern Vermont said, but it's very important also to represent so that these characters also represent the cultures that the, character, the storyteller is coming from because I had drawn, she had been telling a story and I had drawn it in stick figures and I showed her after and she said, mm, the clothing should be different. There should be, and the woman should have a headdress, you know, and she described it all to me. And, and it was so fun to work with her as a storyteller uh, and to get my stick figures to look a little more culturally appropriate. Um, and that's very important, I think. And I, if anything, I, I fall into the trap of like stick figures with baseball hats. Sure, they could be guys from Guatemala, you know. Um, and it's not that I, it, it's partly because I, I never met Jose face to face. Um, and partly because the, this character is based on the story, but it is not the story. But if we collaborate, we can kind of use these characters. Just as Freeman Colby, I, Freeman Colby, I'm sure looks nothing like how I draw him. And, I fear there's a photo out there someday that I'll see and I'll be like, oh, he had a big mustache or an eye patch or something. Um, but that's not really the point of that story. However, if my storyteller, if he were alive and he said, you know, I kind of want my freckles in this or something like that, then I would respect that and I would put that in. Um, I, it's really important to represent that. But then the more details I add, the more it becomes you and not the people in general who are reading this, for better or for worse. And there's times to use that and times not to. Uh, yeah, if I think of any examples of that, I'll, I'll pull them up. Um, I have a bunch more examples. Can I show you one more Vermont story? Oh, I should, you know, I had a bunch of Vermont stories. Um, how many people here know the storytelling of Daisy Turner of Grafton, Vermont? Few of us, good. Okay, so Vermont Folk Life Center. Um, this relates to the, the El Viaje project too. Vermont Folk Life Center has sponsored a couple of projects we've done, and one of them I have here tonight. It's a uh, Turner Family Stories, and we used a, pro a format similar to the El Viaje project where we paired a different cartoonist with a different story. Um, actually, the cartoonist, we all picked our stories from the oral history of Daisy Turner of Grafton, Vermont. And um, if you don't know Daisy Turner's father, Alec Turner, was enslaved in Virginia before the Civil War, uh, escaped slavery during the Civil War, ended up as a basically an undocumented migrant laborer going between Washington, D.C. and Maine, and ended up in Vermont. And the way the story's told, he and his crew saved the town of Grafton, Vermont, and he lived there the rest of his life. Daisy Turner was born there uh, in 1881, I believe, and died in 1985 or six, when I was about 10 or 11. So her oral history reaches back 200 years or more. Um, Stories she learned directly from her dad. So, oh, we're right there. Look at that, that was the next thing I had in my presentation. So that's why I'm thinking of it. So um, I gravitated, of course, towards Alec's stories during the Civil War because they struck me, because they're so different from how Freeman Colby tells his stories of the same times and places right around Northern Virginia and DC. And while Freeman Colby is writing letters home saying, my health is good and here's what I get to eat, um, among many other things, Alec Turner in Grafton, Vermont, after the war, tells his daughter this side of the Civil War. 1865, the end of the war, it was such a holocaust. It had got to be just like a nightmare. The men were dying and hungry. 
no food and fires, no home. The men had got to where they didn't care, and it was just a mad bulldog fight. It looked like the end of the world. Now go look up the photos from Petersburg, 1865, and you'll see what Alec Turner was seeing. Um, and, and if you know his story and the story of what happened to the freedmen after the war and Reconstruction and afterwards, you realize why he sees it as such a survival issue to tell his daughter this side of the war. Um, and working with his story taught me to look not just at the photos that photographers left, but the extra plates they used when they said, the kids who had gathered around the camera, they said, kids, you want to be in a picture? Go sit in there. And they happened to take pictures they didn't go out intending to take. Sometimes these pictures tell you an awful lot about kids a little younger than Alec Turner who were there at the time. Uh, notice they're dressed partly in Union Army uniform, cast off bits um, in the ruins of Charleston, South Carolina in this photo. Wow. So um, the one other piece that we found was in Maine, in Vermont, there are in the archives some photos of uh, Alec Turner and Daisy Turner's family history. And Daisy Turner, of course, had a lot of archival evidence and she had her oral history that she could communicate to it Jane Beck. Well What's that? It's all recorded. Um, they used to play it on public radio. Yeah, Every, right. Yeah. Because just in the last couple of years of her life, Jane Beck from the Vermont Folklife Center yeah. befriended her and worked with her to archive a lot of those stories. So we're so lucky that that work was done. And I worked almost exclusively from Jane Beck's ethnography of Daisy Turner. Uh, but we also found, uh, we, I mean, I was lucky enough that Maine, um, mainmemory.net has this photo from the slate quarries up near Katahdin. That guy with his hands on his hips is Alec Turner. And this is his crew in the slate quarry. Some of these quarries were 300 feet deep. And um, the thing that I look for, I, I zoom in on these photos, looks like maybe he's smoking something or maybe that's part of the picture. Notice the watch fob, little chain there. Well, Daisy tells a story about the watch fob that he had. And it's an important family artifact right around this time. Um, he goes back. So this is uh, in the book. This is how that picture became a deep slate quarry that he's working in all year. And he meets Daisy's mother. And on the right here of this panel, Daisy tells us, he had a gold watch fob Dr. Dayton had given him. And now he gave it to Mama, promising to look out for her. And that becomes basically their, when he proposes to her, that's their engagement gift. Um, and there it is in that photo, right there on his vest, you know. Um, and so it became not so much, I gravitated towards the Civil War because I study so many narratives from that period, but really it starts there. It starts, this story starts at the end of the war and then moves forward into starting a family in what came after the war. Um, and so I, I tried to really focus it on those aspects. Oh, how they all sang and danced and prayed together. Mama could sing soprano just like a mockingbird. And those moments where the families up in Maine and the families from DC and Virginia come together in the little shacks around these slate quarries on winter nights and sing together. Um, and that's preserved in Daisy's storytelling. And um, it's such an honor to be able to work with these stories. Again, we can't, we can't check with Daisy anymore to see if this is appropriate for the stories, but she passed the stories on to Jane Beck, and Jane Beck worked closely with us in pulling this book together, too, along the same lines as El Viaje. So, um, so I encourage you, I guess, last thing um, I'll say is you can try this when you go home. Take a piece of paper, divide it into a couple boxes, and try a comics diary entry. What happened to you today? Um, and give yourself a challenge of drawing as little as possible. What if you just wrote one word in each box and drew one little image or symbol or scribble that represented that? Uh, and keep it simple, keep it comfortable, and try that and see what happens when you catalog your day like that. And pay attention to what you pick to put in there and who you think might read it um, and what you decide not to put in there and just Notice those choices we're making as we, as we create those stories about it, each other and our, ourselves. You may think it's your story,
but it really belongs to a bunch of other people too um, as we intersect. That's what, that's what a community is. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. sale on that table and then we also do have several copies of um, the most costly journey El viaje must, um, must okay uh, at, at the desk that you could take as well and that start are those are those copies of the book people can take home and keep are those they or, or are they lending copies? Uh, good question. You don't have to have a library card. You don't have to have a library card to use the or to check them out. But we would appreciate you bringing them back after you're finished, so that other people in the community can and, and read them as well. Here, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. You have the Daisy Turner one. I do have some of those. Yeah. yeah. Can I make a comment? Sure. Yeah. Um, from the time I was very small. Um, I became very dependent on comics because I'm farsighted with astigmatism. And, and I, often pictures do speak a thousand words, you know. The, it, and I, I, comic books and magazines, I often drew on visuals to help me comprehend information. I love reading, but I struggle with it. I can't sit through reading. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's very important for a lot of us, more than people realize. Mm -hmm. but, but, but just, an ending comment on that. Um, I was, you know, grew up in the 60s, and a cartoonist that was very pivotal to me was the same year I broke up with my fiance and went to jail and went to the original Woodstock Festival. I also discovered R. Crumb. Oh, yeah. And he loosened up my style considerably, because I, I draw too. But yeah. I just thought that was worthy of note. I, I yeah. detect maybe a graphic novel or two uh, in, in <laughs> okay. that story there. Yeah. Or at least a mini comic or two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, if you, on, my, on my site, I have a number of videos that show how I make my mini comics and give some samples and show some quick draws of these pages coming together. Um, so I hope you'll take a card. Uh, I have postcards here, too, from the next book. Um, and check in and let me know what you're doing with comics and, um, and keep in touch after That's this evening. Idea. That's a good idea. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you, Star. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure Mary would be happy to talk to you about some other things and uh, sign some books for you as well. Maybe. <laughs>